relationship with God is the end of our earthly pursuits. And I have three, three passages that I want to show this to you in and, and, and three points that I'm going to make today to try and explain that. So if you would, firstly, if you're following along in your Bibles, you can turn to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. And those verses read like this. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Amen. So what is the world? I don't believe he's saying the creation, right? I don't believe he means the earth, right? It's, it's not this universe. It's not the earth. It's not, it's not nature. So how can we understand what he means by world? When he says world here, I believe what he's saying is the collection of unsaved mankind and the culture that they create. The world is the collection of unsaved mankind and the culture that they create. We can define culture as shared attitudes, values, goals, practices, activities, and beliefs. We can also define culture as the characteristic features of everyday existence. He says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Do not love the characteristic features of everyday existence. Do not love the attitudes, values, goals, practices. Do not love those things of the unsaved. Do not love the culture that they create. Am I saying that we shouldn't love unsaved people? That's not what I'm saying. We love, of course, the unsaved world through kindness, through good deeds. We have a good will toward them, of course, right? We are, we are the good Samaritans to, to anybody who would need us. And I think ultimately the best thing we could do for the unsaved world is to, is to with much prayer and, and much, um, you know, encouragement, be sharing the gospel with them each and every day, every day that we can. We share the gospel with a real, true, and burning desire that they would come to know the Lord and be saved from their sins as we have been. We absolutely love unsaved people in this way. But recognize this about the unsaved world and about unsaved people. They are opposed to your God. They are opposed to your God. The Bible says that sinners are haters of God. In their heart, in, in their being, in their mind, who they are, they are, they are enemies of your God whom you love. By their words, by their actions, by their attitudes, by their beliefs, again, by their activities, by their practices, they oppose our God. And I promise you, if you spend enough time with non-Christians, if you spend enough time with unsaved people, you will see that about them. You will see that by their actions, by their attitudes, by their words, they are enemies of your God. So we love them in the sense that, of course, we care for them and we want to see them come to know God and we do good to them. We pray for those who persecute us, right? But we cannot love who they are in their heart. We cannot love the wickedness that dwells in them. We cannot love who they are and what they stand for as they stand opposed to our God. 
to love that is betrayal to God. And not only that, but we cannot love the culture that they create because the culture that they create reflects their heart of rebellion toward God. Their culture consists of what dwells in them. Verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. What dwells in them is the craving for sin. It's a craving for evil, craving for evil desires that are opposed to God. And it's a craving for self-glorification, that selfish pride. The unsaved person's life is motivated by these things, and therefore the culture that they create exists to satisfy these evil desires. If you don't believe me, turn on the TV to a new show or a new movie for five minutes and tell me what you see. Turn on the radio to today's hits for 30 seconds and tell me what you hear. Go, go read a news article, look at the headlines, look at the things that are going on in the world around us, and look at the things that are celebrated and applauded as good in our culture today. And I know, I understand, not, not everything is, is bad, right? Not every song, not every, not every show, not every movie is totally bad all the time. Not, every, not everything an unsaved person does is totally bad all the time. But again, understand collectively the unsaved world as a whole and the culture that they create exists to satisfy sinful desires and self-glorifying pride. And I would tell you that, well, I think the word of God tells us that if our fellowship and if our enjoyment comes from the practices and the culture and the way of life of the unsaved, if we love partaking in the evil culture that unsaved people have created, the word says the love of the Father is not in us. If we love the world in that way, we can't love God. We can't. If we are having our pleasure and our joy and partaking in the evil culture of the day, then the love of the Father is not in us because the culture of the day has been and always will be opposed to the things of God. Listen to 2 Corinthians 6. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Christian, your fellowship is not with the unsaved, and your enjoyment is not in their culture. Come out from among them, he says. Be separate. Fellowship with God and with the things of God and with the people of God. Live for God. The world, as he says back in 1 John, the world is passing away and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Notice he is contrasting those two things. The world and its lusts are opposed to the one who is doing the will of God. We cannot have both at the same time. If we are fellowshipping with the world and we are fellowshipping with the culture, we cannot be fellowshipping and having a relationship with God. We can't be. If we love one, we will hate the other. Therefore, as he says, be sure, 
the one who loves the world, the one who loves the things of the world will perish with it. But the one who loves God will be separate from the things of the world and they will live forever with God. So our first point is this. A relationship with God is the end of our pursuit of the unsaved world and its culture. A relationship with God is the end of our pursuit of the unsaved world and its culture. For our second point, turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 29, we'll go verses 29 to 34. Our Lord says this, Do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. But seek his kingdom and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to charity. Make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So before 1 John, again, we don't fellowship with the unsaved culture. But here we're being told something a little bit different. Nothing in these verses that Jesus mentions are particularly sin. Right? He's talking about food and drink. He's talking about, in verses prior, he's talking about our clothes, right? What we will wear, what what we will have to take care of ourselves. Jesus is talking about our possessions. What do we possess, right? Food, drink, clothes, those are the obvious ones, but we possess, we possess jobs, we possess careers, right? We have cars, we have a house, we have hobbies, we have our bodies. These are all possessions. And Jesus is saying these are all good things. These are all good things. These are all blessings from God. Everything that we possess is a blessing from God. Our Heavenly Father knows that we need these things. He blesses us with them and he takes care of us with them. So then what Jesus is saying here is obviously not that we should not have these things, but he's teaching about what our heart posture should be toward our earthly blessings. What is our heart posture? What is our attitude toward our earthly blessings? I think the important line is at is at the beginning of verse 29 there where he says do not seek do not seek do not chase after these earthly blessings as the end goal or the ultimate prize of life I want to ask you today what is your end goal of life What is your ultimate prize of this life? Again, hopefully it's not sin or the wicked culture, obviously. But maybe some of us in here, if we were being honest, we would say, you know what? My ultimate pursuit in this life are earthly blessings. Do we spend our lives trying to attain possessions? Do we want to have the nice car and have the nice house and have all the nice things? Maybe we don't desire necessarily that we have to be the richest person, right? But maybe some of us in here would say, you know what? The ultimate goal of my life is probably that that I would be comfortable. That I would have enough, right? If, If I want to buy something, I can. If I have some 
unforeseen expenses. I don't really have to worry about it. I spend my life, my goal, my purpose, my aim in this life, I just, I just want to live comfortably. And I build my life pursuing that. Maybe our ultimate pursuit could be our physical health. It could be our outward appearance. Maybe our end goal in life is just to have a fun, happy life. Not necessarily sin, right? But maybe we live for our hobbies or we live for our entertainment or, again, we live for our comfort. And Jesus is not saying these are bad things. Again, he's saying that these are all blessings. But what you have to understand is that Jesus is condemning the lifestyle that is only in pursuit of earthly blessings. He says the nations of the world seek after these things. What does that mean? He's saying the Gentiles, right? He's speaking to the Jews. So the Gentiles, the people who are not God's people, spend their lives pursuing these things. The unsaved world spend their lives pursuing these things. Their goal is the pursuit of sin and also the pursuit of earthly blessings. They want to live rich, comfortable, happy lives full of blessings. If that is your life's pursuit, please understand Jesus is condemning that. He's condemning that kind of heart attitude. Christian, your life goal, your purpose in this life is not to attain earthly blessings. The unsaved live for those things. Why? Because they do not know a heavenly father who will provide those things for them. Our heavenly father will provide all our needs. And that doesn't mean that we stop working or that we stop eating healthy or, or whatever it is. I'm not saying anything like that. We do those things because God commands us to, first of all. And in doing those things, we trust that he is going to provide for us. He's going to take care of us. He's going to give us everything that we need. That's his promise to us. Not everything we want, everything we need. And not everything that we think that we need, but everything that we actually need. Keep in mind, this promise applied to the apostles and everyone else when they sat in jail for preaching the gospel or when people were being martyred. God never failed his promise. He will provide everything that we need. No matter what that looks like, that promise stands. But I think ultimately the, the reason why we as Christians don't have to pursue these earthly things as our ultimate prize is because our Father has provided something better for us to pursue. He has given us something better to seek after. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why? Because your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. What does it mean to seek the kingdom? Jesus tells us, verses 33 through 34, make yourselves a money belt of unfailing treasure in heaven. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. How do we do that? He says, sell your possessions, give to charity, give your time, give your energy, give your resources to serving people and to serving God. And he says, you will have treasure awaiting you in heaven. So now if you're like me for most of my life, The way you've understood that is that give away your earthly blessings in life and you will have more blessings awaiting you in heaven. We'll have the bigger mansion, right? Maybe we'll be, we'll be ruling over more cities or whatever it is that we've heard. I don't know. We'll have, we'll have more fun things to do in heaven. We'll, have, we'll just have better things. The, our, our chef, our personal chef will be better. Whatever it is, I, I don't know. 
give away your earthly blessings and you'll have more blessings in heaven. Think about what we're saying when we say that. Give away your earthly blessings in this life so that you can have more earthly blessings in heaven? That doesn't seem right to me. I want to challenge that idea because I think what Jesus is saying is this. First of all, he's saying whatever you value most, that's what you'll pursue with your life. If you value money and possessions, you will spend your life chasing after money and possessions. If you value fun or your hobbies or your comfort most, you will spend your life chasing after those things. If you value friendships or the opinions of people or relationships or power or fame, whatever it is, you will spend your life pursuing that. And again, understand Jesus is condemning that lifestyle because, Christian, your treasure is not earthly blessings. Earthly blessings are not the treasure that await us in heaven. But if you value heavenly treasure, you'll spend your life pursuing that. So then what is heavenly treasure? Christians, our treasure in heaven that we have waiting for us is God's glory and a perfect, sinless relationship with him. That's the treasure that awaits the Christian in heaven. Pure bliss with our God and Savior. So let me ask you again, is your treasure earthly blessings and do you pursue that at any cost? Or do you treasure God's glory in a relationship with him and obedience to him? And do you pursue that? at any cost. That's the unfailing treasure that awaits us. And if God is your unfailing treasure, know that for you, whom he has chosen to freely give the kingdom, you will get an infinite abundance of that treasure. We will spend all of our eternities just living in the glory of God, knowing him, loving him, praising him. We will have an infinite supply of that treasure when we're in his kingdom. That's the greatest blessing that we could ever ask for. And we need to use, as Jesus is explaining, we use those earthly treasures and we use those earthly blessings to pursue our heavenly treasure and our heavenly blessings. We use our earthly blessings to pursue his glory, to pursue obedience to him, and to pursue a deeper relationship with him. That's what it means to store up treasure in his kingdom. So for any of us professing Christians in here this morning, again, just recognize what Jesus is saying. If your treasure is not God, and a relationship with him, if that is not your ultimate goal, if that is not your ultimate prize, if your ultimate prize is earthly blessings and you spend your life focused more on pursuing that than anything, understand that Jesus groups you with the unbelievers. I would warn you, test yourself, as Paul says, test yourself to see that you are in the faith. God's people treasure the glory of God. They treasure a relationship with him above everything. So our second point. A relationship with God ends our pursuit of earthly blessings. We no longer have to pursue them. Our father provides them. And he's given us something better to pursue. A relationship with God ends our pursuit of earthly blessings. So for our final point, turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. 
And we'll start in verse 4 and we'll read down to verse 11. And I'll tell you the point right off the bat this time. It's this. A relationship with God ends our pursuit of self-righteousness. Verses 4 through 11. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, this is Paul speaking, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. If anybody could have been righteous enough to get to heaven by their own law-keeping ability or by their own self-righteousness, it was Paul. He says he's the Pharisee of Pharisees. He perfectly held to the religious laws and he held to all the customs and he did so with passion and zeal. He had all the external self-righteousness possible for one man to have. But when he came to know Christ, he realized two things. One is that whatever righteousness he thought he had was really no righteousness at all. He saw himself to be a sinner, and far more wicked than he dared imagine. And two, not only did he have no self-righteousness, but by knowing Christ, he came to understand that he did not need his own self-righteousness. He had no righteousness of his own required for entrance into the kingdom. Why? Because all the righteousness that he needed for the kingdom of God was provided for him on the cross of Jesus Christ. When he came to know the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, Paul came to understand that anything he had of his own was both fraudulent and unnecessary. And not only that, but to him it was actually harmful. He explains that his self-righteousness is counted to him as loss. Why? Because any self-righteousness that we think that we have in ourselves only takes away from the redemptive work that Christ has done for us. If we think that we have something, then we take away from what Christ has done. We were bankrupt. We were in the negative really far. And Jesus paid our debt. Jesus paid it all. The greater the debt, the greater the payment. Therefore, any self-righteousness is lost because it takes away from knowing what Christ has done for me. And not only that, but any hope in our own righteousness is actually just condemnation for us. Our works are rubbish, he says. They're garbage. The only thing that my works deserve is condemnation and the wrath of God in hell. That's the only thing that my works deserve. That's the only thing that my law-keeping ability deserves. 
but the cross is my righteousness. The cross is my escape from the wrath of God. The cross is my salvation. The cross is all that I need to be saved. And the cross of Jesus Christ is my greatest treasure. It's everything for us. And it is there on the cross that I can see my great God and Savior who loves me in the face of Christ. I see our gracious Heavenly Father who has chosen gladly to freely give us his kingdom. That's what the cross is for anyone who believes. He is our treasure, and anything that takes away from his glory, anything that takes away from the greatness of his gift and his sacrifice should be garbage to us. A relationship with God is the end of the pursuit of our own self-righteousness. So for anyone in here who would see themselves in one or two or maybe all of those three categories of saying, my life is the pursuit of a sinful culture, my life is the pursuit of earthly blessings, my life is the pursuit of self-righteousness in order to attain to eternal life, if you're in here today and you realize that God is not your greatest treasure, that the cross of Jesus Christ is not your greatest treasure, what can you conclude? We can conclude that we're a sinner. And we can conclude that we need a savior. We can conclude that we deserve the wrath of God. But the good news is that God has provided a savior. The message of the cross is that God has totally secured salvation as a free gift for sinners. And he has done so by the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. And there is no goodness required of our own. There is no cooperation required on our part. God gives it freely as a gift to sinners who have done nothing to deserve it. He gives it freely to anybody and everybody who will believe in him for it. That's the good news of the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ is enough for us. It is all we need. And if you believe that, he will be your greatest treasure. The cross will be your greatest treasure. So for those of us who do believe and value Christ in that way, for those of us who do love God as our ultimate pursuit and our greatest treasure, this is my encouragement to you and my exhortation. Do better at pursuing him. Continue guarding your heart from the idols of earthly blessings. Continue separating yourself from the sinful world and the sinful culture. Continue praising and glorifying Christ alone as your righteousness and your secure eternity. Continue living that life, growing in pursuit of the glory of God. A relationship with God is the end of our pursuit of a sinful world. It is the end of our pursuit of earthly blessings. And it is the end of our pursuit of self-righteousness. A relationship with God is the beginning of our eternal pursuit of his glory alone. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Thank you, God, that in the cross of Christ, you have secured our life with you forever. Thank you, Jesus, that by your grace and by your mercy and by your love for us, you have chosen gladly to give us the kingdom. Thank you, God, that through faith we get to have the great treasure of knowing you and loving you and valuing you. 
Thank you, God, that we get to live lives having a relationship with you and, and, and glorifying you. Thank you, God, that we have you awaiting us as our great treasure in your kingdom. God, help us to seek you and you alone. Help us to seek your glory. Help us to lift up your name and make you known. God, take that number one spot in our heart and in our lives in every area, God. You are our Lord. You've saved us. You've loved us. And God, we owe you nothing less but all of ourselves and our whole life. Thank you for loving us. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.